So um, what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is probably a little bit of an outlier for the, for the current meeting program. I believe there were other people from geometric functional analysis and convex geometry who were originally supposed to come, but many of them were not able to come for various reasons. So I'm going to take some time to um, develop the background since many people may not be familiar. Um, so the, uh, the topic is Gaussian Brun Minkowski theory. And the idea is that we want Gaussian analogs of classical Brun Minkowski theory, which has to do with volume or Lebesgue measure. So, uh, in order to make sense of our results, I need to tell you about classical Brun Minkowski theory. Uh, so, this is joint work with uh, Matthew Fradelizzi, Dylan Langhurst, and Artem Zwavich. Um, I'm doing something wrong. Well, anyway. Um, okay, so what does Brun Minkowski theory emerge from? It emerges from the interaction between two essential features of Rn, of finite dimensional real vector spaces, namely the linear structure, which involves two operations, right? We have scaling and summation, right? That's the linear structure. And we have a way to measure sets, namely the Lebesgue measure of the volume. And these are just essential uh, features of Rn. So the thing is that scaling and summation for vectors induce natural operations on sets as well. So if you take a set A, a subset of Rn, you can scale the set by a positive real number T. And what I mean by that is I scale every vector by T, right? So the, the vectors X and A are scaled by T. That new set is called T times A. Similarly, I can talk about the sum of two sets. This is just, I look at the sum of all possible vectors where the x, the vector x is in A and the vector y is in B, right? And so that's often called the Minkowski sum. And then of course we have the Lebesgue measure or the volume in Rn, which is unique, which is the unique translation invariant measure on the Borel subsets of Rn up to scaling, right? If we fix the measure of the unit cube to be one, then we get the standard Lebesgue measure. Okay, so uh, let's look at some examples of what these operations look like. So this first example, we have a set. So remember, these are both sets. These are subsets of the plane. Uh, if I take this line segment here and I add it to this horizontal line segment, this, the, the set of all possible sums, the Minkowski sum of these two sets is going to be a, a, a square, right? And uh, in general, when, when you want to visualize Minkowski sums, it's useful to use this representation of the Minkowski sum. I can take, I can write the Minkowski sum of the two sets as the union over all X in A of B translated by X. Right? This is just a completely equivalent way of writing the definition. But then you can see that, for example, in this example, where you're adding the square and the triangle, you can just imagine stacking this, moving this, translating the square, I mean, translating the triangle so that it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, starting off of any point of the square and what you get is this, right? So uh, similarly, if you take something like a square in a circle, you're gonna have the square inside and then you're sort of translating the circle all, ar all around, right? And you take the union of all these translations and you get something like this larger square with curved edges. Make sense? Okay. So, uh, so first of all, I mean, this seems like a very basic, the most basic operation you can do to sets other than union and intersection and complementation, right? I mean, you're dealing with a linear space, you have a linear structure that induces these natural operations on sets. So this is, you know, asking how these natural operations behave is kind of the most, uh, obvious question to consider. And indeed, uh, this question is the focus of Brun Minkowski theory. So you can ask, how does the volume of this Minkowski linear combination behave, right? So you look at lambda one times A1 and so on, up, add them up, up to lambda R times AR, and you look at the volume of this Minkowski linear combination. How does this behave? 
as functions of lambda, as functions of the convex bodies of, I mean, not necessarily convex, as functions of the Borel sets A1 to AR and so on. Well, there are two natural settings for asking this question. The first natural setting is that of compact sets. And you at least want to have compactness because you want this volume to be finite, right? And the volume is guaranteed to be finite if you're looking at a compact set. So, so let's assume that we have compact sets in Rn. Uh, then the brun minkowski lusternik inequality, which is often just called the brun minkowski inequality. Um, uh, I'll come back to that nomenclature in a minute. Says that the volume of, I'm sorry, I should have written volume sub n, but I sometimes slip and write magnitude instead of volume, which is a common you know, shorthand for, for n-dimensional volume. I'm going to try to be careful and write volume sub n because I'll have volume sub n minus one and other things also floating around. So I want to be careful about writing magnitude. But anyway, for now, let's understand this as the n-dimensional volume. The volume of a plus b to the one over n is super additive, right? And an equivalent way of stating that it turns out is that the volume of a convex combination of these two sets, so you take lambda a plus one minus lambda b, that's greater than or equal to the weighted geometric mean of the volumes of A and B. Okay, so, I mean, how can you see that this implies this, for instance, you know, replace A by lambda A and B by lambda, one minus lambda B. And then you see that on the left-hand side, you just have this raised to one over N, but on the right-hand side, you have volume of lambda A to the one over N plus volume of one minus lambda B to the one over N. And now we remember that volume, N-dimensional volume is N homogeneous. So the volume of lambda A is lambda to the N times the volume of A. So you just get the weighted arithmetic mean on the right-hand side. And the weighted the arithmetic mean is at least the weighted geometric mean. And therefore the, this implies that, okay? Turns out the reverse is also true. We won't bother with showing that. Does that make sense though? Okay. So why is this of interest? I mean, one reason is it's of interest is because it implies the isoperimetric principle, right? The isoperimetric inequality in Rn which says that if you take all sets of fixed volume whose surface area makes sense, and there's various ways you can give sense to a notion of surface area, but you want the boundary not to be too crazy, right? So if you, if you look at sets of fixed volume whose surface area is defined, the Euclidean ball has smallest surface area, right? So, so that this isoperimetric inequality is of course uh, hugely uh, important and it explains, for example, why soap bubbles are spherical and so on. Okay, so uh, uh, another reason that the Brun Minkowski inequality is important is because it provides a path to obtaining a whole zoo of functional inequalities. So things like the log Sobolev inequality for the Gaussian, you can actually deduce it as a consequence of the Brun Minkowski inequality. And that the, in the case of the log Sobolev inequality, that was done by Bobkov and Ledoux. In, uh, in a paper where they used the precopa lindler inequality, which is like the functional version of this. It can be proved from the Brun-Minkowski inequality uh, to prove the log Sobolev inequality and so on. So, uh, so, so, you know, those, so inequalities like that are of great use in both analysis and in probability uh, in connection with concentration of measure and so on. Okay, so uh, yeah, so, so one word about terminology. So Brun and Minkowski just looked at this inequality in the, in the context of convex subsets of Rn. And uh, it, was, it was Lusternik who proved it for general compact subsets of Rn. So that's why I mentioned the name of Lusternik there. That is in the 1920s. Okay, the, natural, the second natural setting is instead of considering the compact sets, you consider convex and compact sets. This is a nicer class, a much nicer class. Right, and in this case, you have what is properly, I mean, this is what people, when they talk about brun minkowski theory, they usually refer to this setting, where you're assuming convex and compact sets. And in this case, there's something absolutely remarkable which turns out to happen, which is that this volume of this Minkowski linear combination, this, this function, if you think of it as a function of the lambda one to lambda r, right, this function is a polynomial. It's a polynomial in lambda one to lambda r. Moreover, it's a homogeneous polynomial of degree n with non-negative coefficients. I mean, that is absolutely not obvious, right? It's not obvious at all that they should have a polynomial representation. 
this is some strange you know operation on sets i mean when, when we looked at some pictures and you could see that it's not exactly easy to see what this operation is doing to sets right it's not obvious that there should be some formula for the volume that's that's a that's a polynomial function right but that turns out to be the case and you can think of this as a vast generalization of this basic homogeneity of the volume that i mentioned the fact that volume of a scaled version of a is lambda to the n times the volume so this is a homogeneous polynomial trivially of degree n but this is saying that even if you sum these compact convex bodies the compact convex sets you get some homogeneous polynomial of degree n okay and moreover with non negative coefficients so hopefully you can give those coefficients some meaning right so uh, so so this is uh, you know this is an absolutely astounding result and it leads to all kinds of interesting things for example the alexandrov pentel inequality which relates different coefficients in this expansion uh, which has you know many connections to many different subjects including algebraic geometry and combinatorics and so on which we don't have time to talk about so but uh, but you know there's a gateway to lots of interesting things okay so let's do one specific example uh, we'll look at this a polytope here k and we'll add to it a little multiple of the euclidean ball so from now on whenever i say b2n i mean the unit euclidean ball in rn okay the two refers to the fact that this is the euclidean metric right the little l2 metric if you like so um so uh, right i mean it's the ball in the sense of the little l2 norm uh, so okay so um so so anyway so 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 i'm taking since this is in the plane i'm adding k to t times the euclidean ball in dimension 2 and what i get is something like this right now when i look at this i see that if i want to decompose the volume i i have the volume of k that's hidden inside right but then i also have you know the the first order correction seems to be something that depends on the boundary right so for every piece of the boundary of k you see that i have an area here the area in green right the shaded green area is basically the perimeter of k times uh, t right so i have the perimeter of k which is which is the one dimensional volume of the boundary of k basically right times t and then i have some error here i have these these curved portions the black shaded area this error is of order t squared I mean, it looks like pieces of a circle, so it's somehow of order t squared. The area of that scales like t squared. Right? So what this tells us is that this the perimeter, the perimeter of k is actually this uh, you know is actually this derivative of the volume basically. So if you look at the two-dimensional volume of k plus t times the Euclidean ball, you subtract off the volume of k and divide by t. This is just the derivative of the of the volume as you add in a tiny euclidean ball right that that is exactly the perimeter right so uh so so more generally i mean this is a way to define surface area the surface area of the boundary of some convex compact set can be defined as this as such a limit where you take the volume the n dimensional volume and you add a tiny ball right and you take this you take this derivative okay moreover if you look at this error these black portions right you'll see that actually these these add up you know these angles are non overlapping so it turns out that uh, that these add up exactly to the volume of that euclidean ball to the area of that euclidean ball so this this error turns out to be t squared times the volume of you know this euclidean ball of uh, unit euclidean ball right so which means that if i look at volume now of sk plus t times the ball right i can just replace sk everywhere but i know that replacing k by sk will just bring out an s squared here and an s here right so basically what i get is this polynomial representation of the two dimensional volume the area of sk plus t times the ball which is this just this quadratic formula in s and t where the coefficients have these nice geometric meanings right on the two ends you have the the area of k and the area of the ball and in the middle you have the perimeter of k right so so it's clear that these in this particular example that this pol this polynomial representation is clear and it's also clear that these uh coefficients have some meaning geometric okay so what is the more general uh formulation so now from now on we are going to use kn to denote compact convex sets in rn 
R plus is the non-negative real line. So now if A1 to AR are in KN, so they're compact convex sets, and lambda one to lambda R are non-negative real numbers, then if I look at the volume of this Minkowski linear combination, that's this homogeneous polynomial of degree N in, uh, in the lambdas, right? And this is one way to write it, right? These, these I1 to IN, you know, I have N lambdas, they can repeat, right? But they all draw from this index set one up to R, right? I have these index set. They all draw from that index set. And then the coefficient of, of any particular term is written V A I one to A I N, right? So, uh, okay. So, so these coefficients are called mixed volumes because clearly they're somehow, you know, emerging from mixing up the volumes of these things. Okay, so there's, they have lots of properties. So for example, the first property is that V of A repeated N times is the N dimensional volume of A. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's basically saying that if you look at the coefficient of lambda, lambda one to the N, right? If you look at the coefficient of lambda one to the N, that's going to be the volume of A1. I mean, that's what you should expect from the case where all the other A's are just the, uh, just the singleton point, the origin, for instance, which means you're just looking at volume of lambda one A1. Okay, so uh, it's also symmetric in its arguments. So I can rearrange, you know, I can permute these, these AIs. It's not going to change the value of this V. Okay, so it's symmetric in the arguments. It's multilinear. So, you know, if I fix this dot, 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 this dot, dot, dot is some fixed collection of convex compact sets, then, you know, it's multilinear in each coordinate like this. Okay, it's translation invariant in the sense that if I take any of these sets and I translate it by a constant vector, that doesn't change the mixed volume, okay? And it respects inclusion. So if A is a subset of B, then the mixed volume of A with a bunch of other convex sets, I keep the rest the same. But if I replace A by B, then I get something bigger, okay? So, um, so mixed volumes have all these nice properties. Uh, and in order to, you know, to proceed, we want some, uh, you know, more compact notation. So we will use, V of A1, K1, I put K1 in square brackets to AR, KR to mean the mixed volume of K1 copies of A1, K2 copies of A2, and so on, KR copies of AR. So this is really standing for this, right? It's V of A1, A1, K, K1 times. And the reason this is useful is because we already mentioned that this, that this mixed volume is uh, symmetric in its arguments. So, so it makes sense that, you know, that, that we want to use a shorthand notation because we can collect, there'll be multiple terms that have the same Vs floating around which we can collect together, right? So for example, the simplest case is the case of the Steiner polynomial, which means you look at the volume, the n-dimensional volume of A plus uh, T times a Euclidean ball, right? So, so the coefficient of A is just one. So, so this is just a polynomial in this one remaining variable, namely T. And uh, so, 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 and then you have N choose I, terms which are the same, right? Because there are n choose i different ways of choosing, uh, you know, these of choosing these orderings where I have i copies of the ball and n minus i copies of A. And therefore I have this polynomial expression for the volume of A plus T times the ball. It's the sum of n choose i times this mixed volume of i copies of the ball and n minus i copies of A times T to the i, right? So there are two, I mean, this is, often called the Steiner formula and all of these, all of these coefficients, this is a special case where I used for the second, I kept one body fixed and the other body I took the Euclidean ball. In this case, these, uh, these mixed volumes have the meanings of surface areas and you know, things like that. They have uh, you know, very significant geometric meaning and they're called the intrinsic volumes or core mass integrals of this, of this body A, this convex set A. Anyway, so that leads us in other directions too, which we don't have time for. So I just want to mention that there are two shorthand notations that we will use for the case where you take N minus one copies of A and one copy of B, we will call that V of A semicolon B. And for the case where we have N minus two copies of A, one copy of B and one copy of C, we'll call that V of A semicolon B comma C, okay? All right, so, uh, I need more stuff about uh, convex sets. 
so 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 here is the gauss map so the gauss map so i'm, I'm going to start with the polytope okay because it's simpler to think about uh, to draw pictures in the case of polytopes so so here's a polytope okay the gauss map is a map from putatively i mean i'm fudging a little bit but it's a map from the boundary of a to the unit sphere in rn okay and what it does is it associates with every point in the boundary the unit outward normal at that okay so of course the issue is that the that the unit outward normal may not be unique at these corners you know there is not a unique unit outward normal so so in, in so strictly speaking this na is not defined on all of the boundary of a it may be defined on the boundary of a you remove some you know in the case of polytopes you remove there's a finite set of corners of vertices so you can remove some finite set which is a set of Lebesgue measure zero right so basically you have some um i mean it's it's even a set of n minus one dimensional house dot measure zero so i mean uh so 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 it's basically you have a negligible set of points uh, where the unit unit outward normal is not well defined but everywhere else this this gauss map is defined uh and in this case you know you see that the range of the gauss map is just this finite set of vectors right this is u1 is the outward normal to phase one u2 is the outward normal to phase two and so on right so you just have the range of the gauss map for a polytope is just a, a finite subset of the sphere okay so uh, it also turns out that if a is strictly convex which means there's no line segment in the boundary of a or another way of saying that is that uh, every every point on the boundary of a is also an extreme point of a right there's, there's no line segment in the boundary then it turns out that this function na is injective so if we look at it it's uh, it's one to one so so basically if you uh, you know if, if you um, yeah so so anyway we'll we'll use that fact later okay also, we can talk about the support function. So for a convex body A, the support function H sub A is a function defined on the sphere with values in the real numbers defined by, oh, by, by the way, whenever I say convex body, I'm, I mean a compact convex set with non-empty interior. Okay, so the difference between compact convex sets and convex bodies is that convex bodies, I typically want non-empty interior. Now, a lot of these things also make sense for compact convex sets in general, but sometimes if I want to talk about volumes and things like that you know i wanted to have some volume right for for the situation to be nice so then i want non-empty interior so anyway so so for a convex body a the support function is defined as um uh, as the supremum of these inner products right where i take this this the inner product of this fixed vector on the sphere u with every uh, element of i'm sorry this should be a not k so every element of a convex body a so this is an example this is our convex body a this is the origin if i look at e1 the the first standard basis vector then you know i look at the supporting hyperplane right that's perpendicular to e1 that supports a and then i look at this distance this is just the supremum of this inner product so it's basically mentioning how far out i have to go to meet the boundary in that direction right so so that's the support function and I mean, we'll just need the need it to be defined on the sphere. You can also define it on Rn. Then it would be a one homogeneous function. Uh, so it turns out that the gradient of the support function exists at a point on the sphere if and only if the inverse of the Gauss map is a single point on the boundary of of A. Again, A. Sorry. So the the point is that the point is that the smoothness of you know, and you can you can kind of see why this should be the case, right? I mean, the smoothness of this of the support function has to do with somehow you not having a corner at that point right so uh, so 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 and moreover in this case the gradient of the support function is just this na inverse of u i'm abusing notation a little bit here i'm thinking of na inverse as a set here i'm saying the singleton the single element of that set when it's a single so, but anyway okay so um we can also talk about C2 plus convex bodies, which are basically convex bodies where the support function is twice continuously differentiable. And also A has a positive radius of curvature everywhere. Okay, so uh, that's, I mean, these, the two classes, namely polytopes and C2 plus bodies are often, uh, you know, 
considered because some arguments are easier for polytopes, some are easier for C2 plus bodies, and then you can approximate all convex bodies by one or the other. So, okay, so I need the notion of a surface area measure because it's, it's closely related to the mixed volumes. So this, what is the surface area measure? It's the push forward of the Gauss map. I mean, I'm sorry, it's the, it's the push forward of the Hausdorff measure on, this, on the boundary of A by the Gauss map. So, so, so remember the Gauss map just associates to any point on the boundary of A, the outward unit normal, so the surface area of, in the case of a polytope, you know, in, if this is my polytope A, then the surface area measure is just going to be a linear combination of point masses at these, at these unit outward normals to these faces, U1 to U6 in this case. Uh, and uh, the mass on each uh, vector is just the volume of the corresponding face, right? That's just the push forward of this. So, so, um, so more generally, if you take, if you take a Borel subset of the sphere, the surface area measure of A applied to the Bo that Borel subset E is the Hausdorff measure of Na inverse of E. Right, so Na inverse of E is going to be some subset of the boundary of A, right? And then I'm measuring, so I'm looking at the surface area of that, of, of that part of the boundary, right? Using the N minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure. And that's called, so that defines uh, the surface area measure of A, which is a measure defined on the Borel subsets of the sphere. Okay, so it turns out that if A is C2 plus, then this surface area measure has a nice, you know, it turns out to be absolutely continuous with respect to uh, n minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure, and the the density turns out to be the curvature function of A, which is a strictly positive continuous function which captures something about the curvature of the boundary. Okay, so so why did we talk about all this stuff? Because mixed volumes and surface areas are closely related. We we already mentioned the Steiner formula, right? One consequence of the Steiner formula is that the surface area is just expressible as a mixed volume. Because if I look at the, at the surface area of the boundary, as we said, this can be defined as the limit as t goes to zero of this, you know, of this blown up set minus the original volume divided by t. But now this volume of this blown up set, in the case that A is convex, you know, it obeys the Steiner formula. So I can see that there's a volume of A plus T times N times this first coefficient here, which is just V of A N minus one times and B to N one time, which is just this V of A semicolon B to N. And then the rest of it is at least order T squared, right? So when T is small, that's going to be very small, minus the volume of A. Volume of A cancels out. I see that in the limit, this is just N times the mixed volume of A with you know, n minus one copies of A with one copy of T to N, right? So basically the surface area of A is just a constant times the mixed volume, this particular mixed volume. Um, moreover, it turns out that this, there's a formula for these, for these mixed volumes in general that can be written in terms of the support function. So the, and I'll, I'll shed some light on why this formula holds in a bit. So, so the, um, uh, so this, this mixed volume of, a and B is one over N times the integral of the sphere of the support function of B integrated with respect to the surface area measure of A, right? So this is a representation formula for these mixed volumes using one feature of B, namely its support function and one feature of A, namely its surface area measure. So this shows how these two convex bodies come into the picture when you, when you look at this particular mixed volume, right? The, this A is repeated N minus one times that emerges through the surface area measure and the B, which is just repeated once, comes through the uh, support function. Okay, so one consequence of this is that the surface area of A, which can be, which I said is N times this mixed volume, you know, I can plug in this formula if I assume this theorem, then I see that this is just the surface area measure of the sphere. So it's the total mass of the surface area measure is just the surface area of A, which makes sense. So the surface area measure is a measure on the sphere whose total mass is just the surface area of A. Okay, all right. So now uh, um, it's time to talk about inequalities that we have for these mixed volumes. So these are called Minkowski's first and second inequalities. So Minkowski's first inequality is a lower bound for the mixed volume of A with B, you know, N minus one copies of A, one copy of B in terms of the volumes of A and B. 
and Minkowski's second inequality is is uh, is this inequality here, where you know here you have n minus one copies of a and one copy of b. Here you have n minus two copies of a and two copies of b, right? And here you just have n copies of a basically, which means you're looking at the volume, right? So this is another way of writing it. So why are these inequalities interesting? This the second inequality I won't. Uh, I'll explain why the first one is interesting. The second one, I'll just say that it's a special case of the Alexander of Fenchel inequality. Right? This can be used to, I mean, so, so when you replace this, this, this A here by some, uh, yeah, so, so I, I, I don't want to spell it out, but the point is that this is, this is a special case of this very rich collection of inequalities called the Alexander of Fenchel inequalities, which are of, when you, which have, a lot of implications. So, um, uh, so, so that's what makes this. That's one thing that makes the second inequality interesting. But to, for, to see why the first inequality is interesting, uh, I'm going to look at. I'm going to show you how you can get the isoperimetric inequality from it. So, um, so if you look at the n minus one uh, dimensional, so the surface area of A basically. We saw that this is n b a b two n, and this is greater than or equal to by Minkowski's first inequality. It is greater than or equal to n times uh, volume of b two n uh, to the um, one over n. I'm sorry. So yeah, mess this up be n minus one, right? And then I have here, and then, uh, and then it's just a matter of observing that this is exactly, so this is sort of optimal. This is what you would get for the ball, right? So this turns out to be exactly the volume, n minus one dimensional volume of the sphere uh, times the, uh, Like, like this. Okay, which means that if I fix, uh, if I if I force the volume of A to be equal to the volume of the ball, then the surface area is minimized by the sphere. So. Um, Right, so this basically gives you the isoperimetric inequality. Uh, and how do we prove these inequalities? The way that we prove these inequalities is you can consider uh, the following function, which I mean, they're motivated to look at this by the Brun Minkowski inequality. So, so remember, I said that the Brun Minkowski inequality, you know, one way to write it is to say that if I look at uh, this volume, it's greater than or equal to lambda times the volume of A to the one over N plus one minus lambda times the volume of B to the one over N, right? So if I define F of lambda to be the left-hand side of this inequality minus the right-hand side, I know this is always greater than or equal to zero, right? And uh, uh, so, so moreover, I also know that F of zero is zero. Uh, and uh, so F prime of zero has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? And this, this expression that f prime of zero is greater than or equal to zero gives Minkowski's first inequality. And then I also have that, um, that f double prime of zero has to be negative because, or, or non-positive anyway, since f is concave. Um, and and uh, therefore that gives you Minkowski's second inequality. Okay, so the point is that Minkowski's inequalities came from the Brun Minkowski inequality, which expressed some kind of concavity property of this of the Lebesgue measure, right? So that's that's what I want to emphasize here. Um, uh, and at this point, we can take a breather. How much time do I have left? Twenty minutes. Okay. 
So, okay, so now the question is, can we have a weighted theory, right? So can we replace the Lebesgue measure, which we are using here because it's translation invariant and so particularly nice in the context of Rn with other measures. And from a probabilistic point of view, I mean, the most natural thing to consider is probability measures like the Gaussian. I mean, certainly the Gaussian measure of, you know, Minkowski sums of sets are of, is of interest uh, for many reasons. So, so this, you know, if we are able to develop some weighted theory, some weighted version of this theory of mixed volumes and so on, it should be related to things like weighted surface area, right? So what's a weighted surface area? If you take some measure mu on Rn, which has density phi with respect to the Lebesgue measure, then uh, we can talk about the, the weighted surface area. So this is the weighted surface area, of, uh, surface area measure on the sphere weighted by mu, where we basically, you know, instead of just looking at the push forward by HN by, of the Hausdorff measure by the Gauss map, you insert this, this density here, this density phi here. Okay, so for, for this to make sense, you want your density to be nice. You don't want it to be just integrable because in that case, you know, phi may not even be well-defined on things like the boundary of, of a convex set. You know, you, an integrable function may not be well-defined on some subset of lower dimension, right? So, um, but as long as you have phi being say upper semi-continuous or something, you can show that this makes sense, okay? So for example, continuity assumptions on your density ensure that, that this kind of definition makes sense. And moreover, it turns out that if your A is a C2 plus body, then actually the surf, this weighted surface area measure is absolutely continuous with respect to Hausdorff measure on, on the sphere. And you have this explicit uh, formula for that, which, which involves this curvature function that I mentioned earlier. Anyway, so, um, so one can talk about weighted surface areas. Uh, and indeed, this has been looked at in various contexts. So for example, in the Gaussian case, the beginnings of gaussian brun minkowski theory go back to, for example, the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality and Gaussian concentration and so on. I mean, the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality is some expression of how the Gaussian measure of a set increases when you and the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality says that if you fix the Gaussian measure of some Borel set and you look at the Gaussian surface area, by which we mean, you know, you'd look at this, the Gaussian surface area is just this, uh, just like we defined the usual surface area, instead of volume, you put in Gaussian measure, right? So you take Gaussian measure of A blown up by a small ball, and you look at this derivative of the Gaussian measures. So um, uh, this turns out to be the same as this, this integral, actually. But this Gaussian surface area, if you fix the Gaussian measure of a Borel set, then the Gaussian surface area is minimized by a half space, right? And this is the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality, which goes back to, uh, I guess, uh, Sudakov and Ibrahimov and Sirelson and so on. Um, so uh, anyway, so uh, there's, also, there's also other facts about the Gaussian surface area, which have been noticed and which have implications in all kinds of things. Uh, uh, so for example, Keith Ball and Fedya Nazarov uh, gave proofs of the fact that the Gaussian surface area for any convex body in Rn is bounded by four times the fourth root of n. Okay, so this is not obvious at all that this should be bounded, but it turn, turns out to be the case. Um, and uh, uh, more recently, people have tried to develop, uh, you know, weighted analogs of mixed volumes and so on. So you can ask, what is the analog of this VAB if volume is replaced by some measure mu? So, uh, I mean, this object has been looked at by various people. It's the natural thing that you should write down, right? So mu AB for compact sets AB, uh, you can look at mu of A plus epsilon B minus mu of A divided by epsilon and take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, the limit may not exist, but so, so, uh, so, so one uh, uh, theorem that was proved by Lipschitz fairly recently is an integral representation for this, for this mixed measure, which says that if mu has upper semi-continuous density phi and A and B are convex bodies, then mu of the mixed measure of, so there's that weighted analog of mixed volume, has this integral representation, just like in the mixed volume case, 
in terms of the support function of B and the weighted surface area measure of A, right? This is the weighted, this surface area measure of the convex body A weighted by the measure mu, okay? So, uh, so that's nice. It's, it's an extension of the classical theory, uh, but, but I mean, just to, just to emphasize, you know, what, what is the reason that the weighted version is more complicated? It's because, of course, the measure of this Minkowski linear combination is not going to be a polynomial, right? It's not going to be a polynomial. For example, the Gaussian measure of lambda a plus uh, lambda one a one plus lambda two a two is far from a polynomial, right? If you were to try to expand that for small lambda one, lambda two, you would get some infinite series. Uh, so, um, uh, so, 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 you know, it's not that nice, but still you can look at the, what should, be, this should be sort of the first coefficient in that expansion, if you like. So anyway, so uh, let's observe this, that this mu AB is not as nice as VAB, right? So for example, VAA was equal to the volume of A, but mu AA is not mu of A, right? So, but you can still relate them. It turns out that some relation is possible. Um, because of the fact that mu TAA is just, if I write down the definition, I see that this is just a derivative in T of mu of TA, which means by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I can write mu of A as an integral of, of this thing from zero to one. So there is some integral representation and so on, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not as uh, clear as in the case of Lebesgue measure. And you can compare this integral representation of the, of the measure of the set A in terms of this support function of A and the surface area measure with this representation in the case of the volume. In the case of the volume, this comes from the fact that the volume of A is easy to see for polytopes. The volume of A can be written as the sum of the volumes of these conical regions, right? Which are the regions, uh, sort of, I guess, these, these, uh, these cones that emerge from the origin and go out to each face, right? The sum of those volumes is the volume of A. And the volume of each of these cones, uh, the formula for the volume of a cone is just one over n times the base, the volume of the base of the cone, which is volume n minus one dimensional of F1 times the height, which is the support function in that direction. And so, so that, that means that the volume of A is just the sum. And by taking, by approximating any convex body by polytopes, you can see that this converges to this integral here, which is, uh, uh, anyway. So, all right, so, so we need, so what, what we do with, uh, with Fradelizi and, uh, and Langhurst and Zwavich is to look at um, the case, the next coefficient, basically. So, um, uh, uh, so we can define, um, you know, we can define, we can define mu of A, B, C, Right to be uh, uh, this evaluated at zero zero. Okay, so this is this is how we defined the mixed measure of three bodies. This is the natural analog. So this is the analog of of V of A B C. Okay, and in the case of V of ABC, there's a formula which goes back to Schneider and so on. I mean, actually, I don't know who came up with this formula in the first place, but Schneider's book is the place that I would look if I wanted to look this up. Uh, it turns out that this can also be written as an integral over the sphere of, uh, of HC of U with respect to some measure, right, which is called the mixed, mixed, mixed area measure. So it's, uh, you know, some mixed area measure of A and B. So this is, you know, so basically, of course, this is symmetric in B and C, so you can write it this way, but you can also interchange the roles of B and C. But the point is that you separate out here the support function of C, and then there's some measure on the sphere, which depends only on A and B, which, uh, you know, in terms of which you can write this, uh, this mixed volume. So, uh, so for example, we have this, this theorem, um, uh, which basically says that, you know, I'm, I'm just going to write down the, the Gaussian case because it's, it's uh, easier. Uh, 
um, uh, so if I look at gamma n of a, b, c, but you can actually do this for any reasonably nice measure. If these are convex bodies, then it turns out that you can write this as the integral with respect to the sphere of h c of u times d s, you know, gamma n. So this is the weighted surface, weighted mixed surface area measure starts to become a mouthful, but the, 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 the real point, so, so we, can, we can give an explicit description of this, of this weighted mixed surface area measure in the case, uh, in, the, in, the, in the case of uh, smooth bodies. And in that case, this, uh, this measure turns out to be, um, uh, it turns out to be uh, phi of, um, actually, So n minus one times phi of n a inverse u uh, the usual surface area measure. So phi is just the Gaussian density, uh, but then you have a you have a minus. Uh, uh, Right, integral of Na inverse u and Nb inverse u uh, times uh, Hc of u, uh, sorry, let's see, uh, times dSa of u. Okay, whatever. So the point is that, uh, I'm sorry, there's no, there's no integral. That's the that's the measure. So basically, this 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 weighted weighted mixed surface area measure, right, which is expressing the combined effect of A and B, turns out to be um, given by something that this is this is basically like the. Uh, I mean, this is some weighted version of the of the of the of the Lebesgue case. But then you have this extra term which depends on the surface area measure of A, and the the point is that this. This thing here can be, you know, positive or negative. So the point is that this that this weighted mixed surface area measure is not necessarily a positive measure. It's just a signed measure. That's all you can say is that it's a signed measure, and uh, so so that makes things, you know, I already wrote this formula down. So so that makes things, um, you know, more complicated than in the than in the Lebesgue case, but. Um, uh, uh, but one thing that we can do is we can we can prove weighted versions of Minkowski's inequalities using this representation for this for these uh, mixed measures. So, for example, it turns out that you know this is a version of Minkowski's first inequality. Uh, uh, For convex bodies K and L, you have an inequality like this. This is a weighted version of Minkowski's first inequality. And then you also have weighted versions of Minkowski's second inequality, which um, uh, I'm not going to bother writing down because I, you know, I don't think it would be very illuminating. But basically, the, the idea here is that you know, if, if, if we replaced, I mean, if, if, you, if these second terms on both sides were not there, and gamma n were replaced by volume, this is exactly Minkowski's first inequality, right? So, the, so the, what's new is that you have these second terms. They're not directly comparable, so you can't just get rid of them. But, uh, but, but this in many ways is the, is, the, uh, this is the best you can get, right? Uh, and the way that you show this is to use the concavity properties of the Gaussian measure, just as you know, Lebesgue measure had con has concavity properties, Gaussian measure also has concavity properties. And uh, these are not obvious actually. So one of them was a, I mean, the fact that Gaussian measure also satisfies an, an inequality similar to the brun minkowski inequality for symmetric convex sets, for example, uh, was a conjecture of Gardner and Zwavich for many years until it was recently solved by Eskenazis and Moschidis. But um, anyway, so, um, 
uh, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, all right. So so anyway, so there's there's so so what is this? Uh, uh, I mean, what's what's the big picture, right? So um, uh, I mean, basically, in the case of uh, Lebesgue measure, we have this very nice theory for understanding volumes of Minkowski linear combinations and so on. And the question is, you know, if you replace Lebesgue measure by other measures, then can you develop a reasonable theory? And what we were trying to do here was basically just sketch out some of the basic elements of such, such a theory, right? And see what complications arise when you consider Gaussian measure. And um, so the paper is on archive as of last week, uh, but I'm happy to take questions.